A new age dawns, one in which the king in yellow will affect tremendously. But who exactly are the harbingers of this new future? What terrible creations obey the king's whim, powerful enough to conquer the myriad threats which even now march across the galaxy almost unopposed? Let's dive deep into the specialty troops as well as navy that the king in yellow has created, but make sure you listen to the end. There's a surprise for you about the identity of the King in Yellow in relation to Paradise Lost by John Milton, which will once again redefine his or their true identity in the 40k setting. Against the King stand traitor legions of dreadful influence, an Aldari strike force made of several craft worlds, including the prolific Ulthway whilst the Imperium itself is not at all prepared for his coming. Merely witnessing the Yellow King's perfect realm without the proper indoctrination will shatter the sanity of even specially trained inquisitorial operatives. But given that the King has been toiling over his army's creation almost as long as the Imperium has existed, what truly dreadful, effective abominations has he concocted? Now, if you want to put this video into further context, I've linked two videos within this one's description for you to check out. Watch until close to the end where we'll uncover the new model you could win entering our first ever giveaway. Make sure to subscribe in the meantime. Not simply contained to the King's realm, several of his servants are at large within the material galaxy. While we know certainly they are free upon the world of Sankor and the Angelus subsector, who can say for sure where else they may be found? As Lillian Chase of the Cognite, as well as her grandson, both admitted, the King and his agents all but eliminated the Cognite's ancient galaxy-spanning organization. So really, he may already have significant strength gathered throughout the Milky Way. Firstly, we'll discuss what seem to be the King's foot soldier equivalent, albeit frighteningly powerful ones, that is the Pariah and the Grail, for really, the two are one in the same. Now this is going to be confusing for some, because the process of a Grail's creation, as well as the nature of the thing, seems to, at first, conflict with a significant portion of well-established lore. You see, we discovered during Abnett's Magos collection that Lillian Chase, a senior agent within the Cognite, who, going by the recent End in the Death Part 3 novel, may well be the one in same Lillian Chase who dwelt within the library of the Imperial Palace with Cinderman during Horus's siege on Terra, but it seems she's utilised a warp loom of sorts to create what is referred to as Grail Vessels, in service to the infamous, secretive being known only as the King in Yellow. Bear in mind that at this time, we are not privy to the events of the Beckwin Penitent novel, so discoveries such as this operation are setting the scene for the complex, new lore yet to be created during the Beckwin trilogy. It is said that these grails are the opposite of conventional chaos demon hosts, for rather than demonic parasites caged dwelling within a mortal's form, they are human souls wrapped in an etheric warp energy. In essence, the direct opposite of a conventional demon host. Now the complex work surrounding the creation of grails is referred to as the project, and it is said that the project has been in existence almost as long as the Imperium itself. But what is even more peculiar and the essence of law conflict is that psychic blanks, that rarest of humanity's genome, are the only beings eligible to become a grail. That is psychic blanks who seemingly wield warp powers. Those beings born with the pariah gene, however, are said to be the rarest of baseline humans within existence. And this perhaps explains why this program not only is responsible for creating grails, but also for cloning beings who possess the pariah gene, before training them from childhood in inquisitorial field agent style duties, such as avoiding detection, investigative skills, how to assume and then function as a made up identity, or with the combat prowess to match the most deadly of the emperor's secretive Ordos agents. At the end of our Grail section, we'll uncover a far more devastating use of these Grails, so keep an ear out, because we'll touch on that just prior to detailing what could be the most effective shock troop in all of 40k history. It also seems that, either to become a Grail host, or to become one of the eight, a group thought to be the inner circle of the king, 
one must swallow a wicked looking spider, albino in appearance. We as the reader learn more about the king's servants as time goes on, and there is as yet no conclusive answer as to whether these spiders are swallowed by all grail hosts or only the eight. What we do know is those individuals who have done so speak with a kind of vox-like crackling undertone to their voice. But considering more than a few encountered within the book speak with this crackle to their voice, I would fathom a guess that the spiders themselves are the physical manifestations of the grails and that they are swallowed by the pariahs. So does the king in yellow in his most basic form of soldiery have a demon of light infused within a psychic null. The shape or form of a grail can appear in various ways depending upon the whims of either the pariah host or the being who dwells within the null. This is unclear. Travelling or floating as small fist sized spheres of energy, grails are self propelled through the air, but they can also coalesce into a human form. When they do this, they appear as what is likely the outline of their host body, a man or woman sized figure of pure energy, appearing as green, blue, violet, yellow, or red. Wherever they tread, their footfalls singe the ground and where they are struck down by any conventional non-warp blessed weaponry, they merely rise once more, wreathed in crackling energy. But what are they actually capable of? Well, there seems to be a various rank or skill set which we'll detail more about momentarily, but first let's look into the potency with which these grails do battle. In fleeing from the king attempting to maintain her secrecy as well as safety, Lillian Chase is holed up within the city of Queen Mab in a tower known as Stanchion House. And what should be known about the Stanchion House is that Lillian Chase has had time to prepare for an impending attack. She knows the nature of the King's Grails intimately, perhaps more thoroughly than anybody. There are powerful sigils carved within doorways that could atomize a mortal outright, whilst even the tall glass windows of the tower are protected by ancient psychic warding. However, when but a handful of grails assault this tower in an effort to reach Lillian Chase, they are off put slightly, though do not suffer any casualties and pierce its defences in a matter of moments. Even Interex Maulers, beam weapons which project pure colonated energy, sufficient power to eliminate whatever they target, only have enough punch to temporarily halt one of these beings before tendrils of energy begin to spread where they'd fallen, slowly coalescing once more. It seems only warp blessed weapons such as a word bearer's athaim or a sorcerer's weapon such as a thousand sons kopesh can truly mortally wound these etheric beings. We see an instant where a thousand sons kopesh is swiped against the energy form of a grail, only to finally be rewarded with bright light spilling from the thought form's throat in a parody of vital fluid. Elsewhere, we've seen entire buildings levelled by what seems to be the warp fueled might of these grails, whilst they even seem to be capable of psychically searching for and locating individuals, exterminating them with warp fueled energy. Now, we'll make special mention of the Eight, and as I mentioned before, whilst there is more to learn of the Eight, it is said by some that these are in fact grails which compose an inner council of sorts to the Yellow King. They are supposedly more powerful than their counterparts. A scary thought. Teke the Smiling One, an Emperor's Children Psyker present on Sankor, makes reference to the Eight when speaking to Beta. He even has a little rhyme. Eight for the legs, eight for the points, eight because that is what they ate. Eight for the legs, referring to the spider's form, eight for the points, assumedly the Chaos Star, and of course they swallowed the albino arachnid. So that is what they ate. Catchy. You must know, however, that the King in Yellow does not simply command these beings in powerful displays of violence throughout the city of Queen Mab. The grails encountered upon the worlds of Sankor are in fact only a handful of his wider, organised force. When Beta Bequin herself is transported to the city of Thermycin, she witnesses grails who speak with a vox-like static undertone. They wear white uniforms with gold-trimmed robes, and their limiter cuffs, bracelets upon their wrist which can smother or release their pariah curse, are also golden. However, as Beta witnesses, amid the pariahs or grails arrayed before her within the City of Dust, many are identical. Clones, as we stated before, 
but each also has sigils tattooed upon their necks and the rears of their skulls. The colours of their robes are also different, even between identical clones, with some wearing blue, perhaps violet, a pale absence green, or a deep cochineal red. The same colours it would seem as the Grail's lights witnessed within Queen Mab. What these colours denote has not yet been revealed, but I'm keen to find out. Now, that final devastating use of grails we mentioned before, well, it seems that pariahs who are the epitome of what the project can yield, individuals such as Beta Bequin, can wield Enuncia without causing harm to themselves. Just quickly, for those unaware, Enuncia is a truly ancient, almost completely forgotten language which can bend or even shatter the fabric of time around the user, just by uttering particular words. The power it wields can kill instantly, transport one to another realm, or any other myriad applications. But to summarise such an ancient, potent ability such as Enuncia is borderline heretical, but I'm trying to not stretch this video too long and risk getting sidetracked. The King's Angels More powerful than any Astartes, the King's Angels are magnificent as they are terrifying to behold. Within the novel Penitent, we witness a practically naked angel named Comus Nocturnus, best a Night Lord's Sorcerer one-on-one, -on -one, a sorcerer wearing full Astartes plate. The combat prowess of these angels is seemingly second to none, with Comus even going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Eisenhorn's incredibly powerful demon host Cherubael. Though it won't be until Book 3 is released that the winner of that particular duel will be revealed. Incredibly tall and sporting massive wings as their gene father Sanguinius once did, these angels are pale of skin, immensely strong, and whose wings beat the air like a whip crack. When under the influence of the Red Thirst, as Comus Nocturnus was when he first encounters Bequin, fangs protrude from his mouth and he is consumed by an all-encompassing urge to quench an almost depthless thirst for blood. I've seen opinions on our previous videos that these could be a hybridization of Sanguinius and Corax gene seed, but what do you guys think? If left unchecked, it seems these angels fall prey to the same case which affects their more conventional brethren of the Astartes chapters, a thirst for blood and furious rage. Although when in proximity to Bequin with her limiter cuff off, although her pariah effect does bring the giant a slight unease, he also states that it brings him peace removing the rage and the thirst whilst he is within proximity to her. What little Comus can recall is that he was chained to a rock within an endless darkness. Racked by a thirst so maddening, his suffering was beyond comprehension for a time which he is sure spanned the length of ages through the galaxy. He was not familiar with the world of Sankor, the planet on which it is possible to access the king's city of dust, but he did vaguely recall a war with no beginning or end. He recalls being wrought for this war, a conflict so all-engulfing that it was the end of all things. And during this time he wore red armour. Intriguingly, he also states that the enemy was whatever he saw, that he was commanded but is not aware by whom. Is it possible the King in Yellow draws recruits from those Blood Angels Astartes who have been overcome by the Black Rage. But as much as we can learn from the individual who names himself Comus Nocturnus, we must also not assume that the King's Angels are of the same nature, whether physically or mentally. This is because for Comus to emerge onto the world of Sankor, he seemingly had to traverse the depthless, naked Empyrean that space of horror made manifest between the King in Yellow's Golden Realm and any viable portals from the warp which lead into real space. Commerce may not have undergone the full induction process. He may have yet more changes to undergo. He may be less suggestible than those who serve in the Yellow King's forces, and that's without considering whether his vast reserves of strength are they equal to the King's shock troops or not. Who can say for now? What is interesting regarding the King's angels is that they seem to originate from the Blood Angels chapter or otherwise legions, and that his realm houses thousands of these beasts. We know of their origin, not because of the many similarities between Comus and Sanguinius, but because Beta Bequin, along with her ally Renna, stumble upon a crucified skeletal angel, 
wings and all, close to the portal through to the warp in which Commerce emerges from later. There is some explaining to do regarding that situation, but if you're curious, leave a comment below and myself or one of the community will explain. What is intriguing regarding this skeletal figure, besides its fused beetle-like carapace of ivory bone, is that at its feet lay red Astartes armour. And so, though we may never find out what happened to this unfortunate angel, though I hope we do, it does seem that King in Yellow is doing one of two things. That is sourcing or having sourced his shock troops from the Blood Angels directly before turning them into these beasts, or he is creating his own and supplying their full panoply of war in memory of their forebears. You be the judge, let me know. I'll add the speed at which this angel moves is said to be quicker than the eye can follow. That and the combat prowess of Commerce may be either the outcome of whatever sorceress practice is utilised by the king upon these Astartes, or could even be a symptom of the red thirst, coupled with the black rage. The problem with this latter statement is that Commerce Nocturnus is sound of mind. That, and it would not be so reasonable for the king to harness thousands of these demigod beings only for them to be let off the leash, rabid, as Astartes are when afflicted by the Black Rage. Because remember, as Bequin notes during her time within the City of Dust, these beings were soaring in disciplined formations. From the very minute amount of lore we've learnt so far of these angels, what other troop types of other factions do you believe are the closest equivalent within 40k? I for one am looking forward to learning more of their nature and armament. Custodians. Now the subject of custodians in service to the king is fascinating to consider. On one hand we have perhaps two lines where they're mentioned, but on the other, considering the supposed true identity of the king in yellow, a parallel to the Adeptus Custodes is almost a given. Again, during her time within the King's Domain, Beta Bequin is located, then approached by pariah grails in their natural human forms. During this interaction, she becomes progressively more panicked, spying multiple clones of her old friends as well as herself. One even states they are sisters of the Elizabeth genome, made whole from the same dust. Her mind beginning to unravel, Beta becomes increasingly agitated. This is where we first hear of the custodian's presence. Firstly, it's said that Beta would need to be brought before the king himself, but prior to her meeting him, she would need to be inspected by the custodians. Custodian bodyguards to the king in yellow, a throwback to their function in service to the emperor, perhaps. Secondly, they also seem to act as some kind of senior office or security, as while Beta's mental condition is deteriorating, a pariah mentions that the custodians have been summoned to their aid. Note that the terms adeptus or custodies are not mentioned once, merely custodians. This is no doubt a teaser by Dan Abnett, knowing full well what he's done in dropping these lines. Obviously all we could do here is speculate, something we've done at length towards the end of this video. If these custodians truly are the Adeptus Custodes, could their true nature in fact be those who have retired from service, similar to the eyes of the Emperor? Golden Void Navy The final, though no doubt the most powerful military asset we spy belonging to the King in Yellow's massive force is his flotilla of warships. There are a number of points we need to discuss about the King in Yellow's void assets. Outwardly, there are at least two types of vessels, some being barges and others warships. Regardless of the type, however, all are completely wrought of gold as per Beta's experience in the City of Dust, though I personally believe we'll come to see they are made in fact of auramite, the same material used to fashion Adeptus Custodes' armour plate. At the sight of the size as well as number of these magnificent craft, again Beckwin's sanity is in danger. She is overwhelmed by all she has witnessed to the point of passing out. And what we need to understand here is that Beitar Bequin is an expertly trained field agent who has survived now many horrific, even ethereal experiences only to bounce back determined more than ever. But at the sight of the King's realm, including his vast armada, this is too much to behold. It is such a terrible, threatening thing that she struggles to even put the experience into words upon returning to real space. Another fact regarding these vessels is that Beitar Bequin, despite never having departed the world of Sankor in her life, bears meticulous knowledge of a great many things, 
even the true historic facts concerning Astartes' traitor legions and to a degree the Primarchs themselves. To believe she would be knowledgeable of Imperial Voidcraft is well within the realms of possibility, so when Beta is almost struck dumb by the vastness and sheer quantity of these golden craft, I believe at least, that says a lot. Interestingly again, as one of these immense warships passed over Beta, she noted it was completely silent. I wonder what that's about. Now if you haven't pieced it together so far, it very much seems that the King in Yellow's armies are bred for one thing alone, to oppose the great enemy and destroy it utterly. Pariah, good demons whose very nature is inimical to warp infused life, angel warriors based on the genetic template of the most holy angelic of Primarchs, who themselves seem to be naturally inclined to identify, then effectively doing battle with the forces of chaos, as we see in the case of Commus against Chaos Sorcerers, and then Cherubael itself. Now we promised a fact and further lore consideration which would blow your mind, and as if armies of winged sons of Sanguinius weren't enough, this surely will be. We're all aware by now that the author of the Bequin trilogy, Dan Abnett, enjoys basing a degree of his characters or plots around older, more classical works or mythos. Now I found this comment on a Reddit thread, though the poster had unfortunately since deleted their account. Take the Pandemonium reference for instance, the realm it is said the King in Yellow rules over within 40k. Also referred to in Paradise Lost, published in 1667 by John Milton, an English poet, Pandemonium was the capital of hell itself. Interestingly, and I promised this would open yet more possibilities, Pandemonium within John Milton's publication was built by Mulciba, which is an alternate name for a particular Roman deity, and that being's name is Vulcan. Are the king's armies an answer to the prayers of downtrodden humanity? Those numberless trillions whose ceaseless toil within manufactoria or agri-complex alike grants a dwindling empire but one more day of survival? Or will these flights of savage Astartes or our mutters of null clone piloted void ships grant absolution and annihilation to human xenos or chaos filth indiscriminately? Leave your thoughts in the comments, but come on over to our Discord to discuss 40k lore further as well as show off your hobby progress. The link to join is in the description as always. For those wishing to join our prize giveaway where you could win this recently released Space Marine Captain with Jump Pack, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel, like the video and comment below how you would use this model if you want it. Would it be included in your current army or would he be chopped up at the feet of your own Xenos or Chaos Lord? We will mention this is completely free to enter and that postage to you, wherever you live, is on us. So don't worry about any hidden catches. The winner will be declared on our video in one week's time. So in two videos from now, make sure you're checking in for new content. If you do really enjoy our videos and you'd like to support us in what we do, helping us to do more giveaways like this, or otherwise invest in our recording equipment and studio, swing on over to the Patreon, which is linked in the description and check out what you'd receive under the different tiers of membership. We've been careful in making sure what is included brings value to you. Wanting to purchase some new models? Use the link to Cap Games in the description to head on over to their website. Any purchases made this way help Titan Wargaming immensely. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. Until next time, take it easy and have a good one.